guys, welcome to NinjaCast. Today we're going to be joined by Tommy Reynolds. Tommy is an amazing travel, portrait and wedding photographer and has been in the industry for the last 10 years. When Tommy isn't out photographing remote tribes or bride and grooms, he's producing videos for his behind the scenes YouTube channel, which has an incredible following of over 50,000 people. We're really excited to get going today and hear what Tommy has to tell you all. So without further ado, I present to you, Tommy. Okay, so welcome, Tommy. Thank you so much for joining us. So I hear you're getting married soon yourself, is that right? I am indeed, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Congratulations. We definitely love to hear more about your plans. So how have you found the whole experience of planning your own wedding whilst still working in the industry as a photographer? Do you know, I've, I've genuinely loved the, uh, the whole experience um, and the process of planning my own wedding it it feels a bit surreal that it's that it's actually happening in about 13 months time but um you know I I, I feel like I, I feel like I'm a little bit of a of a minority because and I can only say this because I obviously work with couples as well but I think it's definitely fair to say that it's definitely um the bride are usually the ones who are more excited about their wedding day over the groom whereas in our situation, I because I'm so passionate about weddings, I'm I'm so excited to try and do what I can to give Emily the the absolute best day that that she can have, and so it's definitely uh, an, an advantage being in that industry and uh, knowing certain channels to go to or certain people to speak to to get advice. But right now, as I said, we're 13 months away, and uh, we've pretty much got everything sorted already. She, she's already got the dress. I've already got my suit. We've got our venue. We've got, uh, we know what cake we're having. We know what photographers we're having more importantly. And um, we've got videographers. Yeah, we, we've pretty much got all of the kind of the most important things set already. And we're still kind of 13 months out. So yeah, I, I'm really excited. We're really chilled. And uh, yeah, I'm just, I just can't wait for the day now. I genuinely can't wait for the day. I know it's going to be, it's going to be awesome. Absolutely. <laughs> well, we'll certainly all be rooting for you on the day and we'll keep an eye out for those photos and films coming out too. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so talk to me about your career. What do you love most about the job that you do? Oh my God, there's so, there's so much I love about my career. Um, when, when I was growing up, I, I was such a shy little boy and I was, I was really, I was overweight. I didn't have much uh, uh, confidence growing up, but when I discovered photography, it, um, at the beginning, it, it gave me an excuse hanging from around my neck to walk up to someone and approach and start a conversation. When I started shooting uh, music photography, that was my first thing. That's what gave me that confidence to just walk up to the band and say, Hey, my name's Tommy. I, I just took some photos of, of you and your band. And that's kind of how confidence started to build up, started to make my own way to venues when I was, when I was small and just email people out of my own back because I had this comfort um, behind me of being a photographer or be, uh, having this camera to be able to get that confidence. So, I mean, and then you fast forward to today and I can't believe that I'm being, I'm being asked to, in some cases, get on a plane to go to a destination to, f to, to photograph something. That for me is like first prize is when I'm able to use what back in the day I was using as a, as just a tool to, as a hobby, you know, just for fun. And is now becoming a job. I mean, that is just first prize and being able to do what I love and have that creative uh, fulfillment in what I do is just for me it's first prize so networking has obviously been another important thing as well is getting to know so many people and, and I just think so many things like the butterfly effect without photography I wouldn't that wouldn't have led to that that wouldn't have led to that and it's certain certainly wouldn't have led to this interview now without photography without studio ninja and without every, every most people I know in my life and and who are around me so I literally have a, almost everything to thank for the industry I'm in. So I'm so blessed that I can do what I do and call it my job. I really am. Amazing. That sounds like you're really passionate and you really, really truly do love what you do. Oh, hundred percent, hundred percent. I, I, I can't think of anything else I could be doing with my life. I've wanted to be a photographer ever since I was seven years old. When I said to my mum, mum, I think I want to be a photographer. And she went, that's nice, dear. That's nice. <laughs> and then just kind of shrugged it off. And I still actually have my very first camera. It's behind me. It's a little Wallace and Gromit wind up camera. And that's still my first camera sitting behind me on my shelf. And uh, yeah. 
<laughs> the best pride of place yeah <laughs> So you have a following of over 41,000 people. Am I right there? I, I, yes, I think it's, uh, yeah, about 41,000. I think uh, collectively it's, it's now about 50,000 across all my social media, which is just a mental number. <laughs> wow, that's insane. So talk to us a little bit about your journey, the strategies that you put in place to gain such an incredible audience. I th- well, with my YouTube in particular, which has my biggest audience by far, when I started doing my YouTube, it was never with intent to grow as many fo- followers and get and you know be driven by numbers, which unfortunately a lot of people are. It was never about that at the start, and it, it really isn't now. To be honest, I started because I just wanted to share these little personal projects I was doing, little behind the scenes videos. Behind the scenes videos was what really kick-started the, uh, the jump in numbers. And again, when I think back to why I did that, it was just because I'm into filmmaking as well. In fact, I have a degree in filmmaking, so I'm really into that filmmaking process. And I remember when I wanted to do one of my first projects, I said, I might as well get it filmed because it would be nice to have that as an archive to look back on and say, this is how we did what we did back then. Um, so that's what really kick-started the, uh, the numbers was sharing my creative process because I believe we're, we're in a day and age now where we're just as involved in the creative process as much as the final images or products themselves. Like I know I love going on YouTube and watching behind the scenes videos of other photographers. So I thought I want to do that, but I want to do it in my own style and try and make it a little bit more cinematic. And uh, so that's kind of how the style and where that's come from. And that's, I, I feel like is how my YouTube has grown to what it is now. It's just sharing my creative process, just showing and showing my passion that I have for this industry. And I, I like to think that that's why I've gained the numbers I have. Cause I think that people who are passionate are very infectious, like they're contagious. You just can't help but be drawn towards passionate people. And uh, so I'd like to think that that's what people see when they watch my videos in, uh, cause I get just as excited about sharing those videos and sharing my, um, my creative process as much as the final images so yeah I I think that this goes in hand in hand definitely yeah that's fantastic I mean I we've had a good look at your YouTube and all of your social media channels and everything just comes across as so authentic and as you say it is infectious you seem like you really do enjoy what you do and you enjoy the whole process and getting to the point of having that final product Um, and I think you know for sure I think that's very much why people um, follow you and why you've got such a huge following it's fantastic Oh, thank you, Sally. Yeah, I, I really, I, yeah, it's it's exactly it's exactly that. I'm I'm so passionate about what I do, and I I I think anyone who's passionate can 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 rub off that that um that inspiration, that kind of enthusiasm to other people. Like when you when you uh when someone's passionate about another industry who that I'm not even in. Like I'm not I'm not into cars, but like watching stuff like Top Gear, like I can't help but watch it, even though I'm not into cars, but it's interesting. Um. Uh, there are other examples I can't think of, but yeah, like even watching like the Discovery Channel, like how it's made. It's so interesting watching that creative process. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of, I feel like why people are drawn to my YouTube as well. So it's not just for photographers, but it's also um, for other people in the industry as well to kind of get a grasp and see how other things work. So, yeah. Fantastic. That's amazing. So going on from your following, I know you've worked with some very, very big names in the industry. Um, Sony, Panasonic, Olympus, just to name a few. So <laughs> yeah. Talk me through how you got involved with working in, with such big names. Well, I think following on from the last question um, is, it, I, I honestly believe it's because of my videos. So um, I use my YouTube as a means of reaching out to um, these brands. Now, when I say using my YouTube, I don't mean using the numbers. I mean using the product that I've created, these behind the scenes videos I've created and using them as a marketing tool really to approach them and say, this is what I've created recently. Do you, um, do you want to maybe do a collaboration? So a lot of the people you've mentioned um, brands wise are people that I've actively gone to myself. I've, I've gone out and stepped out my comfort zone and I've actually reached out to them. Um, and have asked, do you, do you want to, do you want to collaborate? Do you want to do something? And I like to think again, if you show passion and if you show some of your portfolio, but if you also have video as well, and this again, I think what's, 
what's made me get those brands is because I'm able to show behind the scenes videos. So there was as a good example when I approached um, Pixapro, which is the lighting company I'm an ambassador for. Um, I've been affiliated with them for a few years now, and we had a conversation a, um, a couple of years ago. And I said, I said to the CEO, I said, way back when we first got involved with each other, just out of interest, would you have taken a chance on me if you hadn't seen a behind the scenes video? So, so not a photo, a video, because back then I gave him two behind the scenes videos I'd made at that point. And then he said, yep, what do you want to borrow? Um, we'll happily work with you. So when I asked him that question, I said, would you have taken a chance on me if you hadn't seen a video? And he went, probably not. And I went, so why is that? And he said, well, well, we could see from the video that we could see that how you treated the models, how you treated the team around you, the, the, how you looked after the gear. Um, it, it, it told a story as well. So we really liked that. And we, we, we liked that we could potentially use that as a means of marketing our own gear. And when it's something like lighting or cameras or anything like that, you don't see any of that in the final product. You don't know what's been, how it's been shot. But using behind the scenes or using a video or time lapse or behind the scenes photos, if you're not comfortable with video, allows you to show that. So that's how I've been able to reach out to these brands and offer not only photographs, but also video as well. And that certainly does help. If you can offer video as well as photos, then obviously it's better for them because they're getting more of a, of a return. That's more of their um, deliverables, that's the word. So um, I will always give them video as a means of a deliverable um, because I think that that just, you're more likely to get a yes from the brand if you can do that. I mean, as a, as a medium, video just does so much better online, you know, if we're talking algorithms and all that kind of stuff, it just generally does better. So if you can provide both, then I guarantee you stand a much better chance of getting a yes from those brands. Fantastic. That's great. Thank you so much for sharing those tips with everybody. So okay. I know that you are a bit of a lover of your personal projects as well and mm -hmm. that you travel quite a lot. Yeah. Yep. I do. Yeah. So can you talk us through why you feel these projects are important to what you do and just generally important to you as, as a person as well? Well, I think uh, when I go back to uh, a couple of years into my career as a professional, I was at a point where I was doing a lot of commercial work, so a lot of commercial headshots, that sort of thing. And when you transition from doing photography as a hobby, when you and transition to doing it as a as a profession as a professional, it's a totally different mindset. When you're now getting paid to do it, there's more obviously of a pressure to do a good job. So because of that pressure, I stopped experimenting with lighting, for example, or I stopped experimenting trying different things because. I didn't want to look like an idiot in front of my clients. I wanted to do my go-tos. I didn't want to experiment in case it didn't go right. But when you're getting paid to do it, you kind of veer off doing personal work or you don't do it for, you know, just for fun because you, you only want to, at that point anyway, I was at a point where I was only picking up the camera to earn money. And I realized that I was about to quit this industry because I thought I'm not enjoying myself. I'm getting really bored. And I was thinking maybe this isn't for me. And what I realized is that it's because I wasn't experimenting anymore. I'd, I'd stopped trying new things and I, cause I was scared to. So that's when I decided to do one personal project a month and I encourage everyone to do the same. So especially if you're a professional, of course, is do one personal project a month for you, no one else, no client involved. It's totally your idea. And that is what's given me my love for photography again. And again, I'm using those personal projects as a means of reaching out to the brand. So we're kind of going full circle with these kind of, uh, with this kind of questioning, which I love, by the way, Sally, is that, is that I'm using the personal projects to reach out to brands. And because it's a personal project, that means I'm obviously passionate about it, which means that they're probably seeing that in those YouTube videos, they're seeing the passion. Then I'm using that as a, as a tool to market brands. And uh, so, so that's why I think that personal projects is so important, especially if you're a professional to not lose sight, because if you try something new, then it's something that if it goes right, you can throw that to the back of your head. And when you are doing a paid work, you can then pull that out of the bag because you know it will work because it's been tried and tested. Um, and it's the same with the traveling as well. I took the opportunity to go to India, Sri Lanka, um, Vietnam, 
Um, these were all self-funded personal projects. And again, I was using them as a tool to reach out the brands. Um, Olympus actually was uh, an example where they reached out to me and they said, we really like your travel work. We want you to use our camera and go abroad again. But again, if we rewind to personal projects, it would not have happened if they hadn't have seen that to begin with, mm -hmm. you know, Nike isn't going to call me up to uh, photograph their trainers because I've never photographed trainers. I've not proved my worth first. So if you're, if you're wondering if you want to reach out to brands or you want to try and use one of their, one of their products or experiment with that brand, then you've got to prove your worth first. You've, you've got to put yourself out there and prove that you can do it. So that's why I did the traveling thing. But again, it wasn't, I didn't do it because I, with the end goal of trying to reach out to a brand. I did it because I loved it because it was a personal project. And if you are getting to the point where you are doing a personal project because you hope that it will attract a brand. And if they say, if you go to them and say, look, I've got an idea. I want to do this. Um, would you guys be interested? If they say no, and you say, ah, oh, well, I, I won't do it then. If you think like that, then it clearly wasn't a project that meant a lot to you because your end goal was just a, maybe a financial thing or just a, a brand thing, you know? Um, it, cause I know what it feels like. I know it feels, makes you feel a bit special if a, if a brand can loan you something, but they're not going to loan you anything or they're not going to work with you unless you've got something in your portfolio first or you pitch them effectively. So don't just go to a brand and say, uh, can I borrow this lens? And they say, okay, what are you going to do with it? You go, uh, well, you know, I'll use it in my next photo shoot. I might do this, you know, they're not going to do it. Think of it like Dragon's Den. You go on Dragon's Den, you ask to borrow the lens and you have to, what are you going to give them in return? So that's why I say, I'm going to take this many photos. We're going to go here. This is the idea. This is the project. This is the pitch. Um, these, this is how the video will look. Here's some examples because I've done it before in my portfolio. I guarantee you'll, you'll be much better in, in a much better position to get a yes. Um, so that's why I think personal projects are important and that's how you can use them potentially to reach out to brands. I think that kind of answered your question. No, I think I did veer off a little. Absolutely. That's <laughs> fantastic. Gave people some, some really insightful knowledge into how you started out with that whole side of things. That's great. So cool, cool. All right. if you are at some of the top photography events in the UK, what would you say your top five tips are for photographers that are just starting out and just venturing into the industry? Um, okay. Um, number one, don't think that you need to buy the most expensive gear because you really don't. When uh, my first travel trip, I went to Sri Lanka, I was using a young Nuo flash. It cost me 40 pounds. I was using a trigger system that cost me 30 pounds. I was using uh, an old Canon with a, with just a couple of lenses. So that whole kit was about 150 quid for just that lighting setup. So you really, and they're still on my wall. There's one up there. There's one through here. I've still got them hung, hang up. They still re mean a lot to me. Um, so you really don't need the most expensive gear. So that would probably be number one. Don't think you need the most expensive gear. Uh, number two, um, I think too much social media can hinder your creativity. So starting out by all means, get ideas from other people. But I think there is a danger of spending too much time on social media. I think if you follow trends, if you're looking left and right constantly at what other people are doing, I think that's going to hinder you and it's going to make you less um, of you. It's, you're not going to be as much as you as you should be. Yeah. Kind of, kind of like that. Yeah. Um, so yeah, so too much social media can hinder your creativity. Just get what you need, get the ideas of maybe from five photographers. So this is a great tip from Austin Cleon. I love right. instead of taking ideas from one person, um, take ideas from five of your favorite photographers. So imagine five of your favorite photographers all got into the, into the same room. They're all going to collaborate together. What would they make if they all collaborate together? That's what you make. So taking ideas from five is a lot better than taking ideas from one because then that just might be seen as stealing. Mm. But if you can, take ideas from five, then it, then it's going to be more, it's going to be more driven and it's going to feel like it's more about you. So that'd be number two. And number three, um, reach out to other photographers, reach out to other photographers and ask if you want to assist them. So this is very popular in the wedding industry, but also in the commercial industry. When I do the odd commercial job, if, um, 
someone reached out to me actually uh, his name was sam he reached out and said i'd love to buy you a cup of coffee and uh and maybe assist you in the future and i've i've had um quite a few students actually come and assist me and speaking of sam he he's now one of my go-to assistants he's pretty he's always the first person i call up um and he always assists me he knows my gear he knows how i like to work but he wouldn't have assisted me if he hadn't reached out to me so because he's reached out to me he's he's now got the uh position where he is my go-to guy um so that would be tip number three Mm -hmm. um tip number four step outside your comfort zone um because it comes back to what we were saying earlier if you don't try new things then you're never going to know if that lighting setup will work if going to that location is going to work if trying that different style of editing is going to work for you so always step outside your comfort zone um, and if it doesn't work, at least you've learned something. You know at least not to do it again next time if you have a paid client in front of you. Uh, number five, um, do as much personal work as you can because for me, uh, the key to success is progression. If you're not progressing, you're not succeeding. So if you find that you're, you're standing still for too long, it's because you're not trying different things. You're not stepping outside your comfort zone or maybe you're 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 looking at social media too much you're obsessing too much about the gear so try new things keep progressing and i guarantee you'll 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 succeed fantastic those were five incredible tips thank you for me. thank you if you could go back in time and give yourself one piece of advice that would completely change the way that you organize your business what would that piece of advice be okay so as a as someone who's self-employed, obviously I'm working for myself. So I'm, I get up when I want, I do what I want when I want. Um, I think if I could go back, I would actually have, have more of a routine in place. I remember when I first started as a self-employed, I was thinking, Oh my God, this is great. Yeah. I can get up when I want. I can go to the gym whenever I want and all this good stuff. And then I realized that I just, by not having a routine, I just, I, I, my priorities just kind of went all over the place. My, my mum always said there is a lot to be said about having a routine. And I remember thinking to when I did work for in retail, at least when I worked in retail, you knew when you had to go to work, when you would be leaving, how much you'd be getting at the end of the month. When you're self-employed, obviously you don't have those luxuries. So at the start, I was waking up whenever I wanted. And I realized that that was actually quite bad for me. And I wasn't, I, I, I wasn't getting stuff done. Like, so now I've got goals, a goal list. I write every day what I want to do that day. If it is a day off, I try and get up and set an alarm anyway to get myself up and out of bed anyway, just to feel more productive. It's more, it might be more of a personal thing, but if I, if I wake up at like 10 or 11 o'clock, I feel like I've wasted the day. And it, I tell myself I've written that day off and it stops me being productive or creative. So getting up early definitely does help um my business being more organized so i try and get up go for a run straight away get back have a coffee and then then i'm ready to work if i delay any of that then i feel like i just it's just probably more of a personal thing but i feel like i write off that day so being more organized having a routine has definitely helped made me more productive in my business amazing that's an awesome tip thank you so final question from me then for today so okay. can you recall what brought you to Studio Ninja and how your journey has been so far? I discovered Studio Ninja from my friend Graham, who is a fantastic newborn photographer. He, uh, I went to him with, um, and it just came up in random conversation, how I was really worried about the amount of wedding clients I was having at the, at the time and being really worried that I wasn't keeping on top of it. I said, admittedly, I'm, I'm really worried that, I've, I'm not going to be able to keep up. I've got so many things I need to remember um, per client. And he said, have you tried Studio Ninja? And I said, what's Studio Ninja? <laughs> so he pulled up his dashboard. He showed me how it works. He showed me how easy it is to, to just be organized. So having a routine, like I said before, but also Studio Ninja have really has changed, changed my business. It really has. Um, and it's obviously, it's no exaggeration. It really has. So when he introduced that to me, I instantly downloaded it. He helped me work through my first kind of workflow um, and kind of get to grips with that. He walked me through the interface, which was pretty self-explanatory to be honest. Um, 
And that was a year ago now. And it's the best purchase I have made. Um, the, yeah, literally, it's the best purchase I've made last year with Studio Ninja because now I'm in a position where I'm taking on as many clients as I can and I don't have to worry now. One of my favorite features in Studio Ninja is the automation. I love the fact that I can be sat watching TV and then all of a sudden I get a email through from my client saying, oh, thank you so much, Tommy, for sending through the questionnaire. Um, we've signed the contract. Here it is. And I'm like, did I send that? Oh, yeah. Studio Ninja did it for me, of course. <laughs> so having that flexibility, saying goodbye to forgetfulness is just amazing. So um, for it's, I use it for my wedding uh, business more so than um, my the other side of my business. But um, yeah, it's just been an absolute dream. I can't recommend Studio Ninja enough. I love it. Fantastic. That's lovely. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Tommy. It's been such a pleasure to chat with you and to find out thank a little you. more about you and your business. Um, so for everyone that's watching here today, um, keep your eyes peeled. I'm sure there'll be more from Tommy in the coming months. He's a fantastic ambassador of ours um, and we really love hanging with him. So thank you very much, Tommy, and we'll see you really soon. Thanks very much, Sally. I'll speak to you again soon. Cheers. Thanks. So that's everything from us today. I really hope you enjoyed the show. Thank you so much to Tommy. He gave you all so many amazing tips and strategies that I'm sure you'll take away to your businesses. If you want to read the show notes or have a link to Tommy's website, you can head over to www.studioninja.co forward slash episode one. Thanks so much for listening and I'll see you next time.